This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist, offering voiceovers, audio editing and mastering, transcriptions and show notes, episode summaries, and even hosting a podcast on a topic important to you. Visit Facebook.com slash Podcast Assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. Subscribe with iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting app. And if you enjoy what you hear, like us on Facebook. Also, consider throwing a little cash our way by visiting patreon.com slash Korea FM. And find more of our great content on our home on the web, koreafm.net. While Korean American adoptee Adam Krapser has only known life living in the United States, for several years he has been fighting to avoid deportation and be made a naturalized American citizen. Despite being adopted from a South Korean orphanage at the age of three, after suffering severe child abuse and neglect from two different sets of adoptive parents, both they and the state of Oregon failed Adam by not fulfilling their responsibility to move forward with the process of granting him U.S. citizenship. As a result, the now 41-year-old Adam Krapser is fighting to bring attention to his and other cases of children adopted to the U.S. but who have never officially gained citizenship. To learn more about the issue and what is being done to correct the problem, I spoke with a group that has been working with Adam Krapser and other adoptees to raise awareness on the issue. My name is Emily Kessel. Um, I am the Advocacy Director uh, at NACASAC, the National Korean American Service and Education Consortium. Um, I've been uh, been at the organization for about three years. We are an organization that was founded by our local affiliates. Uh, So we're a very bottom-up organization that focuses around community organizing, direct services, uh, cultural programming, uh, and uh, advocacy work kind of across the spectrum for uh, the broad Asian American and an immigrant community. Um, From uh, NACASEC itself, we branched off to create uh, with other individuals and other partners um, a coalition called the Adoptee Rights Campaign. So So we are able to expand our work into focusing on adoptee rights. Uh, So that's kind of where uh, we kind of created that space that's uh, allowing more um, impacted individuals to kind of have more of a voice. So it's not uh, coming directly from an organization, Um, although we are, uh, NACASAC is a part of the Adoptee Rights Campaign. How did your organization first become involved with the case of Adam Krapser and everything that he's trying to do to avoid being deported from the United States? We did start off doing um, work around Adam's uh, Adam's case uh, when we had learned that uh, from some of um, some of our partners and then just some other um, individuals that had reached out to us since we are a Korean organization um, that there's a community member that uh, was uh, was uh, in in need of, of more advocacy support and just more support from uh, the Korean community in general. So we had kind of gotten um, involved uh, organically just by wanting to uh, lend some support to some of the individuals that were kind of leading his campaign efforts. Um, and it kind of, uh, we ended up taking more of a leadership role. Um, right now we're not, um, I'm not able to talk uh, about uh, the kind of the support work with um, with Adam. Um, that's something that I, I would have to ask you to speak with his attorney about. But we have um, from there and upon Adam's request as well started to work uh around the legislative fix. So the Adoptee Citizenship Act is um, what we've been advocating around. And so the basic idea behind Adam's case of, you know, he's ethnically Korean, adopted to the United States, but now, um, even though that has been his home for years, he faces deportation. So without talking more specifically about his case, is this something that happens to more than just Adam, to more than a handful of individuals? Is this unfortunately something that happens, you know, too often in the United States to adoptees? Well, speaking broadly about the issue about uh, citizenship being withheld or um, being unavailable to intercountry adoptees, uh, yes, that is something that impacts. uh, We don't have an exact number. Uh, but we know it's um, it's in the thousands or even beyond that. Um, just based on some uh, some digging around that we've done, um, looking at the Korean uh, population in particular, we were uh, previously able to uh, work with the Korean consulate and the embassy to be able to uh, find a number, which is of course not a set number, but 18,000 um, being the number that weren't um, tracked for the net, uh, that the children. Who were adopted from Korea uh, were naturalized. So that's something that the sending country and the receiving country are supposed to communicate about to ensure that that child receives citizenship. So uh, 
that's just the number that they weren't able to get confirmation from. So we know that that, and that's just from the Korean population alone. So whether that number is smaller because uh, there's a chunk of um, that 18,000 that were able to secure citizenship through some means, or uh, there were numbers that weren't included in there that still have citizenship problems, even though they were checked off as having uh, been naturalized, uh, we, we know that that number is high. And it's um, we've been finding cases uh, through the Adoptee Citizenship uh, Act work uh, and through the Adoptee Rights Campaign um, kind of coalition work as well that have come from India, Costa Rica, Korea, just across the board, uh, just that have been kind of sprouting up as we've been doing more efforts. So we know that this is something that impacts many different individuals from different sending countries, uh, many different individuals from across the states. And then so this Adoptee Citizenship Act that you've mentioned a few times, tell me about that. What exactly does that entail? Sure. So it's the current legislation is the Child Citizenship Act of 2000, uh, which was enacted during the Clinton administration, um, and it became law in 2001. And the pro- the flaw that we're finding now with that the current legislation is that it had a, a crucial a crucial piece of information that left out people based on the age uh, that they were when that was enacted. So if you were under uh, if you were under 18 um, at the time that that uh, law was enacted, then you were you were covered. So you were automatically recognized as a citizen. Uh, but for those who were 18 or above uh, at that time, they, you are not uh, that law does not apply to you. So unless you're able to secure citizenship prior to that time, if your parents uh, or you were able to do all of that filing, um, knowing that you had that responsibility pr- prior to that time, then people can still get that. Um, but the Adoptee Citizenship Act is basically the fix to that loophole, uh, making citizenship retroactive for all intercountry adoptees who are legally adopted. Uh, so that w- it would correct that uh, that issue that thousands are having right now. Correcting this issue, as you put it, seems like, uh, I think to most people, a very reasonable thing to do. But as is often the case, unfortunately, in the United States, and I say this as an American, um, very reasonable things are often um, not quickly um, put into legislation or are sometimes delayed for years on end. So where do you think this Adoptee Citizenship Act is going? And and do you think it might be put into law anytime soon? So... Of course, there are a lot of different factors that come into play. Um, the, we were happy to see that it was uh, the a version of it was announced first in the Senate in November 2015, um, and there was no House bill at that time. Uh, but as we began doing more of adoptee-led uh, organizing and advocacy work um, through different series of days of action, call-in days to bring attention to the members of Congress that really have the power to move this legislation or not. Uh, and just to gather more community support, uh, we were able to happily see the House introduce a version of this bill um, in June of this year, 2016. So we saw that as progress, so that there is movement. Um, we have we have a version of the bill in both chambers. Um, we're it's sitting in the Judiciary Committee, so we know that who we have to talk to. Um, so we do we do see there as being potential. Um, and we are going to give it our all um, operating under the assumption that there is a chance for us to move it during the very small windows this year. Uh, but we are going to remain committed even if it does not pass in this Congress to making it a huge priority for the next Congress to take on right away. I know that a lot of the comments that have been coming to me and then to some of the others that I've been working with uh, from people who are curious about the issue is, well, what do we do if we feel very powerless? Um, kind of knowing that this is an issue, it seems like uh, something that's a no-brainer. Uh, Adoptees should have citizenship, and they're brought here, and they're part of American families, they're Americans. Uh, so I guess I just, for anyone who is looking for some, looking for more information, um, to just, I guess, to reach out to the Adoptee Rights, uh, the AdoptiRightsCampaign.org website, um, that has more information there. And just to really just call your uh, your senders and your representatives and just tell them that you think this is an issue and you're hoping that they'll prioritize it this year because lives are lives are really at stake for this. Uh, so, yeah, I would just uh, leave it to that. But please care for this issue. Emily Kessel is the advocacy director for the National Korean American Service and Education Consortium. Even without worries over naturalization and citizenship, Korean adoptees in the United States and countries around the world often face other issues. And I spoke with a Korean-American journalist and adoptee living here in Seoul 
who's telling these stories via the Adapted Podcast, a new audio interview project dedicated to sharing information about the lives of South Korean adoptees. My name is Kayomi Getz. I'm a full Fulbright Senior Scholar for 2016-2017 to Korea. Um, My project is looking at um, the experiences of Korean American adoptees who um, repatriate back to Korea um, or, or, you know, uh, move back to Korea for some time. And um, I do have to uh, put the caveat on that uh, my the my <laughs> the opinions I express are not necessarily that of the Fulbright program, uh, the Korean American Educational Commission, um, the U.S. State Department, or the Korean government. And so, Kaomi, as you mentioned, you're here in South Korea, ethnically uh, Korean, but uh, an adoptee who grew up in the United States. Um, Adam Krapser is in a somewhat similar situation, except he was never naturalized. He doesn't have uh, U.S. citizenship. And so I wanted to speak with you because you're doing this audio podcast um, you know, getting people's stories while you're here in the ROK. So first off, why did you apply for the Fulbright? Why is this something that you wanted to do? Well, I think that, um, you know, there, generally speaking, there is just a lot more um, being produced by adult Korean adoptees. Um, and l- there's more um, people are coming back doing documentaries of their own return um, oftentimes it's their first time back to Korea. So that whole experience, and we're just seeing more of that out in the the landscape and also people writing books and memoirs, uh, poetry, uh, writing songs. Um, there really is just more of an outpouring of people documenting those experiences and what it's like to grow up, um, in the States, in Europe, um, often isolated in white families for the most part, um, which also means white, um, often means white communities and schools, friends, and really just that whole um, coming to terms with their uh, Korean American identity, their Asian American identity, and then um, on top of that, an identity being Korean. Um, And it sometimes happens later in life, and it can happen at any time, Adoptees, you know, no one has the same exact experience of when that happens. Um, You know, for me, it happened pretty, I would say, last year. I I mean, obviously, I always knew I was an adoptee, a Korean adoptee. Um, I had lived in Asia before, not Korea, but I'd lived in Hong Kong and Japan. So, um, you know, I... I was definitely comfortable with my identity as an Asian American, but I don't think I necessarily felt anything special to Korea necessarily. Um, oftentimes adoptees are grow up um, kind of completely isolated from Korean American communities, which are often centered around Korean churches. And uh, there is um, obviously a language barrier. Um, and, and, and just, there has been this, um, I think, um, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I do believe over the years that, you know, there has been kind of a disconnect between Korean American adoptees and the Korean American community, uh, communities across uh, the U S just, there isn't always a way for adoptees to connect into those communities, which are based on family are centered around churches. Um, and so for me, uh, it, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist and I, was doing a story on Korean adoptees in the New York area who are who are coming together, and actually they had been for about twenty years. Last year was the, or maybe it was this year, but they they it's been about twenty years that they've been uh, together. It's a group called um, also known as, and you know it's providing services, support, things that a lot of adoption agencies hadn't been providing in terms of uh, post adoption. Um, services, support, um, language lessons, um, talking about feelings, getting together, having dinners, um, that kind of, um, you know, camaraderie and, and, you know, 
you know, really, I think the, the, the thing is that uh, adoptees find so, um, you know, they're, they're drawn to, to, to meeting up is because they're just other people in the world that really they can relate to of having uh, a common set of experiences, even though each person is, you know, their own specific um, situation is, is unique. But having said that, adoptees do come with um, a lot of experiences that other adoptees can definitely relate to. And that not, you know, if you're not an adopted person, uh, internationally adopted person, you know, you may not really fully understand what that felt like or what that feels like. So anyway, this group has been getting together and I wanted to do a story about that. And as I was researching and interviewing um, adoptees who had been, you know, very instrumental in forming these groups in the 1990s, actually, was when kind of, uh, you know, a critical mass of adoptees had reached adulthood and independence um, away from their their families. Um, that is when I actually started to learn more about um, the community in general and also just um, getting in touch with my own um, adoptee identity. And um, last year I came back to Korea for the second time after being adopted and I went on an adoptee tour and, um, you know, to be honest, I hadn't spent that much time with other adoptees. Um, I maybe knew a couple casually, but that really wasn't the reason we knew each other. It was just through sort of mutual friends or we lived in close proximity, but it wasn't really about being adopted. And so that trip last year, it definitely was being about being adopted. And um, there are various groups, NGOs, nonprofits that do offer these tours now for adoptees to come over. Um, they pay their own way, but once they're here, everything is covered for, you know, 10 days, two weeks, uh, room board, travel tickets, everything. And they pretty much take you around. I mean, each tour is a little different, but the one I was on, um, you know, took us around Korea. We saw lots of you know, sites and we went into the countryside and really into some remote areas. And we saw lots of things that, you know, regular Koreans may never see. So, um, uh, and it ended in Jeju. We flew back and, you know, it was really, um, for me, it was great because the tour was all in English and it really felt welcoming. And I think that all sort of sparked this, um, interest in, coming back to Korea myself, but also what is it like here for other adoptees living here? And um, I think that, you know, it all kind of came together that I proposed the project to explore that as well as, you know, provides a vehicle for me to be here as well. Listening to everything that you just mentioned, it sounds like um, aside from a case like Adam Krapser, who really, when you when you think about it, had a horrible experience with, with uh, different um, families growing up in the United States, and then, as I mentioned, wasn't naturalized, so now he's fighting deportation. But even if you don't have such a bad experience with your families, um, with what you just mentioned, it sounds like you have to deal with a lot of issues, and it can be um, very trying for someone growing up um, in the way that you just described. Um, and, and as you also mentioned, um, for someone like myself who's not adopted, I might not know um, you know, if you're not having abuse from your parents or there's not something specific, I might not realize that there are other issues that can really um, affect you growing up in the United States or in Europe or anywhere else a Korean adoptee might have grown up. So um, was that maybe one of the reasons, aside from also being a journalist, that you wanted to do a podcast so people could learn about these experiences and, and the difficulties or just things that adoptees face, even if they grow up with a very loving family? Yeah, that's exactly right, Chance. Um, you know, it's it's kind of, I think, it, you know, it's it's become, become better known now that, you know, throughout the years, I mean, it, uh, international adoption, um, Korea has been, you know, one of the pioneering countries uh, for international adoption um, to, uh, to the United States. And one of the things is 
throughout over time the research about the impact to either the adoptee, the, um, the adoptive family, parents, um, all the research in terms of what that's like and, and the, the adjustment and forming bonds and, you know, just the whole role of um, child development. Um, well, oftentimes that's, that has been researched by adoptive parents. Um, in terms of journalism stories, also adoptive parents who are also journalists wrote uh, about, you know, they did the first early accounts of, you know, adoptive families. And I think um, a lot of listeners will probably even recall that for, a, you know, a certain time period, it was pretty common to see front page in the newspaper, local newspapers, um, there's a picture of an Asian Korean baby in the hands of white parents. And that is really, um, it's telling a story, but it's from a story from the white adoptive parent perspective. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that adoptees bring in terms of perspective and understanding of what they themselves went through. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that a lot of adoptees now are trying to counter is getting our own voices out there. Um, and it's sort of countering because, um, the, the basic, um, um, you know, what's been known about adoption, what you and I learned about adoption growing up. I mean, we're both from the Midwest, what we learned about adoption growing up in the U S has basically become an, coming from the perspective of either non-adopted people who were researchers, psychologists, socialists, teachers, um, parents, or they're coming from um, um, adoptive parents who are, you know, journalists or how, what have you. And that's a specific set of, you know, um, ideas about, you know, how adoption impacted them. Um, and there isn't really, and I guess what I'm, what I'm dancing around is, is um, adoptees have a more complicated um I think relationship with adoption um, for adoptive parents, it is basically a win for them. It is that uh, they were able to um, add to their family. They were able to um, have a daughter, a son. Um, their lives were enriched. I mean, they they got something that they didn't have before. And for adoptees, it's more complex. Because um, maybe not as children, we may not realize it fully, but growing up as adults, um, you know, there does, it, it does get introduced an idea that maybe it, it hasn't been all a win and maybe there has been some losses. Um, maybe there has been things that, you know, were left behind, people left behind, relationships, families, a life, um, you know, feelings, uh, there's all these things that, um, make it just much more complex for adoptees. And it's something that, you know, adoptive parents may not always understand. Um, sometimes some parents are threatened. Um, and it, you know, it can, it, you know, it can be still a very sensitive topic. And so the podcast really sets out to do a couple things. One is to let adoptees tell their stories from their own perspective um, and also to come back, you know, I think it's very empowering to come back to Korea um, of your own free adult will and, you know, just to explore why you wanted to come back and how what your relationship to Korea is. And it is different from um, person to person uh, in terms of motivations and, and how they're experiencing Korea. Um, and some of that has to do with even just their degree, their ability in the Korean language, because language is a big part of um, the experience here. So um, that was just a big reason. And also to, to really add to, you know, all the recent um, adoptee produced projects, uh, films, um, books, research that is starting to really, um, you know, 
really um, expand and increase people's uh, the whole adoption adoptive community's knowledge about the impact on um, the the international adoptee and just what their life is like over time and not just uh, a snapshot of what kids you know how how well adjusted or what kids you know were thinking as an eight year old or as a fifteen year old I mean that is where a lot of the the early studies were based on interviewing kids, interviewing kids who, you know, were were not yet adults and independent thinking uh, in terms of being separated from the dependence of their family, their adoptive family. So I think that as adults, adoptees have a lot to share about what they went through. And I think that can only help, you know, future adoptive parents, families, um, the agent, the whole adoption agency culture. I mean, hopefully that these, uh, the more we know about adult adoptees is helpful for, you know, everyone related to adoption. And so finally, Kaomi, you've uh, already performed multiple interviews that are up online on this podcast. So how do people find that? Um, you can go to adaptedpodcast.com. You can also look for us adapted on iTunes. Um, and um, I'm hoping to put out, I don't really have a set schedule, but I'm hoping to, you know, be pretty consistent either, you know, biweekly perhaps as the safest <laughs> thing to put out there. But biweekly, sometimes I might, um, have a bunch of interviews that I could get out weekly, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to stick to a somewhat regular schedule. We have four, four episodes up now and um, I've just started my project. So there will be many more. And I assume you're also uh, interested in finding people to talk with uh, about these issues. So if someone is a Korean adoptee and wants to share their story, um, they can get in contact with you, right? Absolutely. And I'm willing to, travel all over Korea. Um, so um, wherever someone is, it ge- uh, geography is not a barrier. I can go there and uh, meet with you and, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, uh, share your story. Kaomi Getz is a journalist and Fulbright scholar living here in Seoul. I'm Chance Dorlin for KoreaFM.net. This episode is brought to you by Podcast Assist, offering voiceovers, audio editing and mastering, transcriptions and show notes, episode summaries, and even hosting a podcast on a topic important to you. Visit Facebook.com slash Podcast Assist for more info on their flat $30 per hour rate. Talk radio, music, and podcasts from the Korean Peninsula. Korea FM 